In my country of origin, it's considered idiomatic to refer to a person of any gender as guy. However, overseas the situation has become somewhat problematic, and I will attempt to comply. Now, far be it from me that only I should say what other people are offended by, though I think the energy is better spent on present-day atrocities and the environment. But if you can't beat him or join him, then dodge him. So I turn to the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. By which I mean the internet, that collection of cats and memes of narcissistic Facebook rants and entitled brat Twitter streams. And I think I found a pronoun which I feel will nicely cull all the problems associated with the others. Because let's face it, folks is slightly dull. So with my arms spread open and my head humbly bowed, I bid you all welcome. Greetings, cowards. <laughs> Now, at this point in a speech, I would usually take a cheap shot at one of the body corporates, say, uh, Microsoft or Google. But given that they tend to be the corporate sponsors of these sorts of events, I thought that would be somewhat uh, unproductive and unintuitive. Much like Windows 10. Moving on, my name is Matt. I do some programming and stuff. That's the website that I've got. I do a bunch of header-only libraries. One of them is Colony, which this talk is on. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Colony, uh, this talk is maybe not for you. Um, maybe you want to go and check out the CPPCon 2016 talk first, because um, that gives a better high-level overview and an idea of performance and an idea of usage, all that sort of thing. Uh, for this C++ data container. Um, that talk is a little bit outdated in terms of the description of what actually happens in this container, um, but that's non-problematic in terms of just getting that general high-level overview. Um, this talk is really to give you something that's not as low-level as the code, but is sort of mid-level so that you can look at the code and go, oh, okay, I understand the general structure of what he was trying to do here. Um, and also give you an understanding of how this container can be, uh, can be implemented in alternative ways. Um, the colony container is currently in the process of standardization. Um, who knows whether it'll actually get through or not. It's up to fate. The name of it may change for the standard library. Probably won't change for my implementation, but whatever. Okay. So some brief bits on Colony. So it has low and constant latency for most operations. It has high iteration speed compared to something like a standard map or standard list, etc. It has extremely high arrays and insertion speed. But probably the main thing uh, about this container is that it preserves valid pointers, iterators, etc., to non-erased elements regardless of subsequent erasure and insertion in place operations. And I'm not sure how that you got in there on the end of in place, but okay. <laughs> it is good for scenarios where you have a lot of unordered data um, because the insertion order is unordered. So when you insert into a colony, you're not guaranteed that that element will be inserted to any particular place in the colony. Um, so it's good when you have a lot of unordered data and you're raising or inserting on the fly, and or you have multiple collections of interrelated data, so collections of data which refer to each other, or just where preserving pointer iterator validity um, is important for some other reason. So this container came out of me originally uh, making a game engine and just seeing that there was this situation that came up again and again and again, and it wasn't solved by any of the standard library containers. Or rather it was if you use standard list, but that's a very slow container nowadays because it uh, allocates each element individually and it allocates them all over the place in memory, which is bad for cache locality and bad for performance. But anyway, the scenario is that 
in games, you generally have some class which is an entity class of some description. And it is a class which constitutes, uh, basically it has a, it's a has a class rather than a is a class. So it has this and it has that. It has this graphics component and it has this sound effects component. And it's got to be able to refer to all those in real time and not have those references be um, invalidated. At the same time, pardon me, it's very cold in here. Um, at the same time, there's also things that obviously refer to those entities. So you might have a level structure or you might have a collision structure, so an arc tree or a quad tree or whatever that is referring to those entities. And the entities also refer, tend to refer back to the quad tree, to the collision structure. Um, because when the entity disappears, say you've got an enemy or a destructible wall or something and it gets destroyed, then it has to be able to tell the collision structure, okay, that thing's gone now, right? So it also has to be able to have a valid reference back into the collisions thing, right? So you've got all these interrelationships going on, but at the same time, um, you've also got a lot of erasures and insertions happening. So new enemies come in, old enemies are destroyed, this sort of thing. So one of the most standard ways of dealing with that is something called a bucket array. Uh, which is sort of a bit like Colony, uh, except that you just have memory blocks, and for each element in each of the memory blocks, you have a Boolean of some description, which just describes, okay, is this object still active? If it's active, then we process it. If it's inactive, then we don't. Um, and when you iterate over those entities or whatever to process them or update them, um, you just check that Boolean. So Colony does a similar thing, but it does it in a slightly more complicated way that tends to be better for performance. Now, so, there's three core aspects to this container. The first one is a collection of memory blocks as opposed to a single memory block like a vector. Um, that just means that you don't get reallocation when your memory block becomes too full, you just allocate another block. The second thing is a method of skipping erased elements in O1 time during iteration. As we just mentioned with bucket arrays, that constitutes a Boolean skip field of some description. Um, and this is a, as opposed to, as we would in a vector, reallocating the subsequent elements uh, during erasure because obviously reallocation leads to invalid pointers and iterations, which is not what we want. The third thing for a colony is an erased element recording, well, location recording mechanism. So this is so that if we make an erasure, we have an erased element, and then we have a record of where that erased element is, and then the next time we go to insert into the container, we insert to that location rather than to the back of the container. That increases cache locality, uh, cache locality. For example, if you're iterating over the container and you've got all these gaps that you're skipping over, then that decreases your cache locality. And yes, I'm sorry for all the Americans, I say cache instead of cache. It's just, cache sounds weird to me. Cache is like the folding stuff that you give to homeless people. Cache sounds better to me. Also, you know, it's got an E on the end, so let's, let's just go with that. Anyway, you've got these gaps and they're not great for your cache locality. Um, so if you get rid of those gaps, then obviously it's better. Particularly if you've got, say, a large block and you've got a large amount of gaps. So you've got one element here, you've got another element here, and in between you've got a large number of erased elements. Ideally you want to get rid of that gap there. 
For those of you who don't understand cache locality at this point, I'll go over it extremely briefly, but really you should go and watch Mike Acton's CPPCon talk from, I believe, 2014. Data-driven design, um, or oriented design, I forget. But basically, access is domain memory, uh, 100 to 200 times slower than access is to cache. <coughs> The CPU reads from main memory in chunks. So if you read one thing and that th and then another thing happens to be in the same chunk in main memory, you reference that first thing, that's already in the cache, then you reference the second thing. If it's in that chunk that was read from main memory, it's already in the cache. That's the basics of it. And so you save however many nanoseconds. Reusing all of those erased elements low cache also decreases the number of block allocations and deallocations because in a colony or in a bucket array, uh, when a memory block becomes empty, it basically gets chucked away, right? So if we're reusing those locations, then A, we're not having to allocate a new memory block, and B, we're not having to get rid of the old one. So it's good for performance in that way. So I'm going to go into each of those three core aspects in more detail and just show how I do them and how they can be done. So for the collection of memory blocks plus metadata, you can do a linked list of blocks, which is essentially what I do, uh, or I should say an intrusive linked list of blocks, or you can do a vector of pointers to blocks, right? Um, the blocks have a growth factor. Um, this is useful because basically you want to you want to be able to do the same thing as vector where somebody might not know in advance how many elements are actually going to end up in this thing, right? So you want to start from a small number, maybe eight or something like that. And then the next time you allocate a block, you double the size or sorry, the capacity of the container. And for each block that you allocate, you keep on doing that. So 8, 8, 16, 32, et cetera. Um, generally speaking, that's a good, good rule of thumb for how to expand a container. Um, but because of that, we can't do a vector of blocks. Even if we did do a vector of blocks, that would create reallocation in some way, shape, or form, particularly when you're removing one of these blocks. So, the blocks have a growth factor. Um, the minimum and maximum block capacities can be user-defined, um, but they're also defined by the container itself. So, the user can't go outside of the capacity limitations that are defined by the container, but they can go within them. And that means that, for example, if a game developer knows what their cache line size is, and they know what their uh, element sizes are, then they can specify a fixed size for each of the blocks in the container. Um, now you could house all the block metadata separately from the blocks themselves, or you can put them together in a struct, which is what I do. Um, the metadata includes a skip field or whatever your other erased location skipping mechanism is. Um, and any data related to the erased location recording mechanism. Um, there are two bits of other metadata that are strictly necessary. Uh, one of them is size, so the number of elements, uh, non-erased elements that are currently in that block, and capacity. Now, the reason, hold on, the reason why those two are so necessary is because um, you need to be able to know when one of these blocks is empty because you need to get rid of it. Um, and I'll go into why that is in a second. Capacity is necessary in order to ascertain where the end of the block is. As I said, uh, we're doing a growth factor. So most of the block sizes are going to be different. And for the most part, that's non-problematic, but you can't predict it. Uh, you can't predict the capacity based on the number of the block in the sequence because 
some of those blocks might become empty and then they're thrown away. So you could have a sequence of blocks in terms of capacity, which is like 4, 8, 32, 128, whatever. Now, why do we need to remove the memory blocks? Stops the iteration from being 01 if we keep those memory blocks in place. And it introduces unacceptable latency. So you can imagine if you've got a active block here, which has got non-erased elements in it, you've got another active block here, and in between it you've got, say, five memory blocks, which are all completely empty. That means when we iterate from the last element in this memory block to the first one in this one, we end up having to do a whole bunch of branches in between. We go, okay, is this one empty? It's empty, it's empty, it's empty here. Um, now you could end up with anywhere between zero and 100 empty memory blocks between those two, so it's not great. Also not great for memory. We kind of want to free that memory up if we can. Um, however, we can also retain those memory blocks if we want to as reserved blocks in much the same way as the reserve function does. So the reserve function will allocate uh, enough blocks for the size, rather the capacity requested. Um, we can also basically add to those memory blocks, right? Um, but we don't want to keep all of them. We don't want to keep the really small ones because smaller the block is, smaller the number of elements there are in that block and that's bad for cache locality. Okay. So, there's a bunch of st different strategies you can apply to figure out, okay, which ones do we actually preserve? The one that I went with in the end based on benchmarking was we only preserve the one that is currently the back block in that linked list. Um, the reason why that works is because A, that's gonna be all things considered the largest uh, block in the chain. The other thing is that it gets around that scenario where uh, you've got some sort of uh, stack-like scenario where all of these blocks are filled up with elements, so you're inserting to the back of the container, and say you insert eight and you've only got five element spaces left in that back block, so it ends up allocating another block. But then in the next bit we end up erasing let's say 16 elements, so then we get rid of that block and we go back to this block. And then we insert eight elements and we allocate another block and it goes back and forth, back and forth, and deallocate, allocate, deallocate, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's really bad for performance. So you don't really want that. Oh, is my audio quiet? I think my audio is coming through okay. We're going through okay. I've just had a Q&A question, so everybody else can hear me fine. Somebody else is saying, yes, thanks, it works fine, okay. So, Roy, I'm going to assume that it's just you that went quiet there for a second. Cool. Hopefully that won't happen again. All right. Where was I? So stack-like scenario, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so you don't really want that sort of scenario. So even if we just keep the back block when it gets removed, that means that when we go to fill up uh, the now back block, we don't have to do another allocation and we don't end up with that scenario. Okay, so this is basically just what I've gone over, um, just for the benefit of those who are uh, reading this on slides or um, for the deaf, etc. Um, so the disadvantage of retaining any blocks at all is that you can end up with a lot of wasted memory space, particularly if you have, say, 15 memory blocks and you just erase from the back, and you end up with all of these memory blocks here which are retained. Um, so for that reason, I introduced the trim function, which just takes any reserved blocks and just chucks them, um, as opposed to shrink to fit, 
which will do reallocation and try to store all of the elements that you've got in as few blocks as possible while adhering to the maximum and minimum block limits. Okay, second core aspect. Um, so a method of skipping erased elements in O1 time. So this is not a Boolean skip field. I'll go into that in a second. Before we get into that, bunch of abbreviations, sorry, LCJC, low complexity jump counting, HCJC, high complexity jump counting. Block, uh, when I say block uh, in this talk, I'm basically going to be talking about the colonies element memory blocks as opposed to, um, say, a skip field or whatever. So a skip field is an array of integers or bits used to skip over certain objects in an accompanying data structure during iteration. We were talking about um, bucket arrays earlier, and typically the Boolean would not be part of a skip field. It'll be just um, a member of the struct for that particular element or whatever. Um, but a skip field, we're talking about something that's separate from the elements themselves. Um, skip block is a run of skipped nodes within a skip field. So in this context, we're talking about a run of raised elements. The start node is the first node in any skip block. So the first erased element in that run. The end node is the last erased node in that run. And the middle node is any non-start, non-end node in that run. So... Boolean skip fields, they are non-01 in terms of iteration. Why? Because non-erased element, non-erased element, in between, anywhere between zero and a thousand erased elements. You don't know. So you end up with anywhere between zero and a thousand branches in between while doing this one iteration, which introduces unacceptable latency, particularly for things like games. Um, also, you get a heck of a lot of branching going on, which, depending on your processor, can be very bad. And depending on what your sort of stats are in terms of how many elements are erased, you can end up with some really bad branch prediction scenarios on certain CPUs. If you want more on that, go and see the CPPCon 2016 talk. Um, the advantages is, is that they're very simple and they're potentially useful for multi-threaded versions of containers in general um, because it's much simpler to do things like atomics with them. Just going to have a quick look at the chat. Yep, cool. So low and high complexity jump counting skip fields. Um, this is something I came up with. Um, if you want the real full details of this, uh, go to pleflib.org. That's got both of the papers there. Um, I will go into them very briefly here in terms of just describing how they work in terms of structure and iteration. Um, but the complex part of them is really the updating of them. So changing, for example, if you've got a run of raised elements here, and then you get another erasure here, how do you update that block? That's the slightly more complicated part of it. Um, so the low and high complexity re refers to the time complexity of the algorithms, not to the actual complexity per se of the algorithms. Um, I previously referred to them as the advanced and simple jump counting skip fields. Um, this kind of, eventually I realized this was pretty inaccurate. The low complexity version isn't actually simpler per se, um, but both provide a one iteration between any two non-erased elements. So you don't get all that branching and you don't get that variable number of checks in between. Um, the time complexity between those two patterns, between the low and high complexity patterns, differs in the actual modification of uh, skip blocks. Um, the HCJC allows, so the high complexity jump counting skip field, allows for recording of middle nodes, so non-start end nodes in our skip blocks. In terms of reusing uh, elements, so recording erased element locations and reusing them at a later point in time. The LCJC doesn't, but that 
turns out to be non-problematic. At the time of the 2016 talk, I was using the HCJC, now I use the LCJC. Um, and originally when I came up with these patterns, I had an acronym in my head, Theatin, which just stood for Traversing Homogeneous Elements Yielding immorti Immortized Time O-N. Obviously that refers to iterating over n number of elements. Um, the reason why that's somewhat significant is because the patterns can be used for, you know, outside of this sort of situation, for describing, for example, um, wanting to skip over, say you've got a bunch of red and green elements, and you just want to skip over the green elements and only process the red elements. So you could use it for that sort of scenario. Um, and in the past couple of days, I finished a paper, which is also up on PLFLib, um, which is modulated jump counting skip fields, which is more for that kind of scenario. But anyway, moving on. So high complexity jump counting skip fields. So here's the Boolean skip field at the top, the equivalent HCJC is underneath. So the start and end nodes record the length of the run. The middle nodes record the left distance to the first non-erased element, so the zero. Um, and that can be useful when you're recording and reusing individually skipped nodes. So if you think about that three there, if we've got that location recorded um, in terms of our reuse mechanism, then we go to there, we go, okay, that's three. So we check on both sides, is there a zero on either side? No, that means we're not a start or end node. We're a middle node, three, go back three. Now I know where the start of that uh, run is. And from the number at the start of that run, I also know where the end of that run is. Now I can split that skip block in two, right? The low complexity jump counting skip field doesn't bother with all that. It just ignores the middle nodes. So all three of these are equally equivalent LCJCs that describe exactly the same thing because we don't care what the status of the middle nodes are. They could be uh, numbers from previous skip blocks or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, have I tried using SIMD to skip power of two numbers of elements? Just looking at the Q&A. No, I haven't, and I'm not sure how that would work uh, because most, you know, all things being proportional, half the time, well, most of the time, your number of elements is not going to be a power of two that you're skipping over. So um, maybe you can describe that in more detail and I can go into it at the end of the talk if we've got time. Um, all right. So low complexity jump counting skip field, the start and end nodes record the skip length as per the HCJC, the middle rec nodes record nothing. Um, now, since those middle nodes are recording nothing, we can't use those middle nodes as part of our uh, erased location reuse mechanism, right? But we can, instead of recording individually skipped nodes, we can record skip blocks instead, which just means that we just store, for example, the location of the start node of any given skip block. Um, and this turns out to be a little bit better because you've got uh, less things that you need to record in terms of your reuse mechanism, and also reusing the start or the end node of a skip block is better for two reasons. A, it's a less complex operation because you're not splitting a skip block in two, there's fewer instructions. Uh, you're only updating the start and the end node um, and the node that you're reusing. Um, the other thing is that when you split a skip block in two, that means you're introducing another jump. So you've got one singular skip block, you know, iterate, 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 jump, iterate, iterate, iterate. As soon as you start uh, reusing middle nodes, then immediately you're going iterate, 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 jump, jump. So you're introducing more jumps and you're also reducing uh, your cache locality. So better to reuse the start and your nodes. 
the iteration code for a Boolean skip field is above. So you just plus plus and you keep on doing that while uh, that entry in the skip field is equal to one until you reach a zero. The jump counting skip field doesn't involve any branching. You just go plus plus and then you add the number at the skip field node that you've just reached to your index, you go for that number. So uh, for non-erased elements, that's going to be a zero, so you're not going forward any. For erased elements, it's going to be the length of that skip block, so it takes you to the next non-erased element. Um, you can go to those locations to see how that works out in terms of benchmarking. Much, much better, particularly when you've got um, you know, a high, a high percentage of erasures. So in terms of skip fields, you can either do them per memory block or you can do a big global skip field for the entire container, which would effectively be a vector. Um, the reason why that's not good is because you create reallocation when you get rid of those em empty memory blocks. So memory block, memory block, memory block, big skip field, middle memory block gets removed, big skip field, have to get rid of all of those nodes, reallocate these ones backwards. Um, so that introduces unacceptable latency during arrays, also unpredictable latency, which is not good for games. Um, I keep on saying unacceptable latency, that's because you know, the channel this has been going through in terms of standardization has been SG14, which is the low latency, high performance, et cetera, et cetera group. So um, that includes games, high performance trading, all of those fields, and almost all of them require um, low and constant time latency, just in terms of being able, being able to predict um, how much time your particular operation is going to take, right? Um, the other issue with a global skip field is that it forces the use of platform bit width integers um, because, you know, effectively you don't know how big your run of erased elements is going to be. So you have to be able to describe um, potentially an incredibly long length, right? Uh, whereas if you're doing per element memory block skip fields. So memory block of elements, skip field memory block, memory block of elements, skip field memory block. If you're doing that, that means getting rid of those um, skip blocks is trivial when you get rid of that memory block. And you don't have to do any reallocation. Um, and with a bit of magic, a little bit of forethought, you can actually allocate both of your both your memory block and your skip field block in the same allocation. Um, you end up with a tiny bit of additional overhead in terms of extra memory use, but it's pretty non-problematic. Okay, so memory block capacities. Um, now the bit width of the skip field effectively limits the capacity of the memory blocks. Um, because you know a jump counting skip field node has to be able to describe um, a maximum uh, run length. So you've got your memory block size, you've got your skip block. Your skip block only has to be able to describe a skip that potentially goes from the start of that memory block to the very last node. So which would basically mean that all of the elements in that memory, memory block are erased except for the last one. So you have to have a bit width that is capable of describing the cap capacity of that memory block effectively. Um, so for example, if you have an 8-bit skip field that effectively limits your memory block sizes to 256, um, 256 is a little bit low in most cases. So I end up going with a 16-bit um, skip field, um, which makes the maximum block size 65536. 
Um, and what I found was going up to 32-bit was actually worse, even if you have a very large number of elements, um, because you end up with a greater statistical likelihood of having very large blocks with very few elements in them, which is not great for cache locality. It's better if you have slightly smaller memory blocks so that they are more likely to get chucked away when they get um, empty of elements. Um, but I did find that for under a thousand elements, um, 8-bit skip fields, so limiting the maximum block capacity to 256 performed better, um, and obviously wastes less space. So that became a template parameter, um, which has now been renamed to something else. It was just, the template par parameter was originally just the actual integer type, and now it's a enum which basically switches between the 16-bit and 8-bit um, skip field types. So, if you've been following along and you're actually understanding all this by now, and if you have, congrats. <laughs> um, you may have thought of a couple of things. One, you could with the low complexity jump counting skip field, you could use basically consecutive skip blocks of a lower bit width. So instead of having 16 bits, you could, for example, have a eight bit skip field. And then when your skip blocks get larger than the eight bits, um, then you basically uh, put in some sort of magic number there into the skip field. So let's say 255, and when we encounter 255, that's an indicator that we need to interpret the next two or four or however many skip field nodes as the length of the skip block in a higher bit width. So let's say we're doing eight bits, we encounter 255, and then we read the next four numbers and interpret that as a 32-bit integer, and that describes the uh, length of the skip block. The problematic part of that is that um, it forces a check for every marker and for every time you iterate over the skip field and forces additional instructions. So it's going to be slower. It's going to waste less memory, but it's going to be slower. Q&A question. So the question is, common simple game engine blueprint seems to be based on a collection of polymorphic entities with some sort of customization point. Are colonies a good fit for these, possibly as a component? Is that something your game engine is whilst doing? Yes, that's pre precisely what the game engine was doing. Um, and yes, it's a very good fit for that sort of scenario uh, for the reasons I described um, in terms of having multiple different containers of multiple different things, entities referring to them, and also things referring to entities. So you can erase things and insert things on the fly without worrying that your pointers get invalidated. Okay, so continuing on, another approach uses bit arrays to determine whether a given node is skipped and stores the jump counting data in the erased element memory space instead. So um, essentially this turns it into kind of a Boolean skip field, but using a bit array. And then when we encounter a one, so a skipped element, then we go back to the erased element memory space and we reinterpret that as our jump, ca uh, jump counting data. So for example, okay, iterating 00001, one, we go up to the element memory block, we go to the uh, element in that memory block that corresponds to that one, and we reinterpret cast that via pointers as uh, just a, let's say, a 32-bit integer. We read that and it says six, okay, we jump forward six. So that's a way that you can use very little space, so one additional bit per element, uh, 
for a skip field while still skipping over stuff in 01 time and not having a variable number of branching instructions. Um, but there's a lot more overhead in terms of what the CPU is doing. You have to interpret the bit arrays, so that's shifting and masking. You have to do a read of the element memory as, as well. Um, so it's possible that this could perform well. I don't know how well. I don't think it would perform as well as the current setup, but again, I haven't tested this, so. Now, so third core aspect. If you've gotten this far, then well done. <laughs> so we need to have some kind of mechanism for reusing a raised element memory space. So I've gone over the cache locality problem. There's a little bit of a graph there on the right um, indicating how and why this has become a problem. If we didn't have this massive gap between processor and memory performance, we'd just be using standard lists. We wouldn't care. But we do have this massive gap, so we have to care. So ideally, we want to have as many of those gaps that we create through erasures filled in as soon as possible. And that's why insertion into a colony is considered unordered, um, because you're not guaranteed as to where exactly your element is going to end up. Okay, so initially when I was doing the 2016 talk, Colony was using a stack of pointers um, to erased element locations, um, but this is problematic because, as somebody pointed out to me afterwards, because, you know, when you're using a stack, that means that you're creating allocations during arrays, which creates exceptions, which is not what the standard wants. So, um, well, creating potential exceptions during arrays. Um, you could alternatively just go through your skip fields. Uh, you could go through each of your memory blocks and go, okay, is size equal to capacity, i.e., are there any erased elements in these memory blocks? If so, then just scan the skip field until you find a erased location. You can do that, uh, but it's time consuming, it's non-01, variable latency, etc. So after all that, the only real probable solution, as far as I know, is a free list. So if you're unfamiliar with free lists, Basically, you're creating a linked list, typically a singly linked linked list, out of erased element locations. You just reinterpret cast that space via pointers as nodes. So you could do a global free list or a per block free list. So at the top there, you have the free list head, which is just a member variable, and that points to your first erased location, and that points to the next erased location, et cetera, et cetera. Um, per block is the same, but you just have a free list head per block, and then you have something like a uh, an intrusive linked list of blocks that happen to have erasures. Um, in that way, you can make the reuse uh, 01. Just go to the block with erasures list head. Okay, what's the first block there? Go to that block, go to the free list head, find the first erased location. Okay, is it the... Is that the end of that free list? Okay, then we remove that from the block with erasures list head and we make the next block with erasures in that chain the list head. So still O1. Um, using free lists means that you have to over align your type to the width of a free list node. So if you're singly linked, that would mean one pointer. If you're doubly linked, that means two. Um, so that could potentially mean 128 bits on most systems nowadays, which is probably not what you want. Um, you know, it's fine if you're using a small struct or something, but if you're storing something like pointers or integers or something, then you end up with a lot of wasted space. But if you do per block, uh, to, per block, per block, um, free lists, then instead of using pointers, you can just use indexes. And since we've got 16-bit skip fields, 
then those in indexes also only need to be 16-bit. Um, so that reduces our over-alignment requirement down to 16 bits, which is not so bad. Um, it means that you only introduce uh, over-alignment if you're storing chars in a colony, which I'm not quite sure why you'd want to do that, but you, you, know, you could do that. You could definitely do that. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what I do. Um, you can't really do a global free list in that situation because a colony is a bi-directional container um, for reasons that should be reasonably obvious. You don't know where all those gaps are. It makes it very difficult to have a bracket bracket operator. Um, global free list also means that when memory blocks become empty, you have to traverse the entire global free list to find any of the raised element nodes that were in that uh, free list and get remove them from the free list so it's kind of problematic um, so with high complexity jump counting skip fields it was possible to record uh, the location of middle nodes as I noted um, I've kind of gone over all this stuff earlier in the talk um, with a LCJC you can't do that you can only record the start or the end nodes which means just recording the skip blocks. So what we end up with is a per block free list of the skip blocks that are in that um, skip field. And we have to have it doubly linked. Um, get into that, why that is in a moment. Okay, um, so just a reminder of what an LCJC skip field might look like. Could be any one of those three, so we can't reuse the middle nodes. Uh, because going to those middle nodes doesn't tell us anything about uh, where we are on the skip field or what skip block we're part of, etc. Um, so we have to have a doubly linked free list. The reason for that is when you have two skip blocks and one non-erased element in between, what that means is when you erase that element, you're going to be joining those two skip blocks, right? That means that one of those skip blocks has got to die. It's got to be removed from the free list. So you could just iterate over the free list, but the free list jumps all over the place in memory, and you don't know how much you're going to be, how long you're going to be iterating for. So that becomes a operation with unpredictable latency. But if you have a doubly linked free list, so two 16-bit numbers, that means that you can go, okay, we've got these two skip blocks, we've got the erased element in between, we erase, sorry, the non-erased element in between, we erase that element, we go, okay, now we have to update the skip field, we have to create one skip block rather than two, and so we take one of those skip blocks and we go to the corresponding element in the element memory block, and we go, okay, here's our free list node. Here's the next uh, skip block in the free list. Here's the previous skip block in the free list. We go to those two skip blocks and we change their previous and next pointers respectively so that they point to each other and not to that skip block that we've just gotten rid of. So it basically enables us again, to do the arrays operation in 01 time, rather than some sort of undefined time complexity. Um, anything else there? Uh, no. Okay, so you got through it. That's the core stuff. We have our linked list of memory blocks, plus metadata, a growth factor of two times, a minimum capacity which is algorithmically defined based on the type size. It basically, basically, we don't want less element memory in there than we have metadata, so we kind of do it on that basis. If we've got a very small type like a char, we'll end up with more of them in the first block than we would for, say, a very large struct. Um, the maximum capacity is determined, as we said, by the skip field type. So in most cases, that's going to be numeric limits max for 16-bit unsigned int. 
um, although that is switchable to 8-bit. Um, we're using an LCJC skip field using unsigned 16-bit integers, but we can switch to 8-bit for reduced memory usage and higher performance on lower numbers of elements. And we have per memory block, doubly linked, index-based, free lists of skip blocks with a per container intrusive singly linked list of the blocks which happen to have erasures in them at the present point in time. <sighs> so correspondingly, our iterator structure contains pointers to the group, which is just the name I've given for the structure that holds both the pointers to the memory block, the pointers to the skip field for that memory block, plus the metadata associated with that memory block. We have the element pointer and we have the pointer to the corresponding skip field node. Um, we could alternatively use a group pointer plus an index, um, which stops us from having to have, you know, because the index into the skip field is going to be the same as the index into the element memory block. Um, but I've tried doing this like three different times at different points in implementation of Colony over the years, and it's always been slower. So don't do that. Obviously, if you're going to do a different approach to how you build a colony, um, such as using the bit array and storing the jump counting data in the element memory block, um, then the structure is going to be different. Um, so just one additional detail in terms of the skip field. Um, so say you've got 256 elements in your element memory block. In the skip field, you're going to have 257 skip field nodes. The reason I do that um, is basically it, it's a very small optimization. Well, I say small, it has a big impact in terms of performance optimization during iteration. So that's our jump counting skip field uh, iteration code above. But for every iteration, you've got to check whether or not you're in, at the end of a given memory block in the sequence, right? So when you get to the end of that memory block, you want to skip to the next memory block. Now, the problematic part of that, and here I'm going to indulge me, I thought it would be so cool to have a chalkboard as part of a C++ programming talk. So, All right, so let's say we've got a skip field for a given memory block and we're getting to the end of it and this is the sequence. Oh, three, zero, three, zero. And that's the cutoff, that's the actual end of the skip field in terms of the actual elements that it corresponds to. So this is the extra skip field node. Now, if we don't have that, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to get to here. You know, we're here, right? We go plus plus, we end up here. Now we go to that second instruction at the top there. We add this to the current index, right? And that brings us to here. Now, if we're, doing, if we're doing that block check at the end, that's all good, right? So this situation is absolutely fine with the code above. We only check for, um, we, we don't need to worry about that at this point in time. We already know that we're at the end of the memory block. So at this point, this is unnecessary, right? However, in this situation, where we have zero, 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 if we don't have that one here, we go plus plus, add that, it's nothing, plus plus, add that, it's nothing, check for the end of the block, add that, plus plus, it's nothing, check for the end of the block. Now, okay, we're not at the end of the block here, right? So we're just still going with that code at the above when we're only checking for the end of the block after we've added the value of the skip field to the current index, yeah? So at this point, if we go plus plus, gets us to here, read the value of the current skip field node 
at this point, we're introducing an out-of-bounds out exception, right? Because that memory is not part of the skip field. We are at the end of the memory block, but yeah. So that's why we have the additional node, zero. What that allows us to do is do that above code. If we don't do that, then we have to have a check for the end of the block after every plus plus and after the i plus equals si. So that's basically what that accounts for. There are probably other ways that you could do that, and I did explore them uh, when I was building this, um, but I found that they were all slower or led to slower iteration code. So that's the way I do it. And an extra 16 bit of uh, wasted space is no big deal. Hopefully that's clear as mud. Okay, so this is what I uh, think of as vaguely fun stuff. So various different optimizations and we'll go briefly into splicing and sorting. So as mentioned, colony is a bidirectional container. So we can't do brackets operators. We can't just uh, do plus equals 16 to our iterators, unfortunately. Um, reasons for that should be reasonably obvious, um, basically because we don't know in advance where our where our skip blocks are, right? Uh, but we can significantly optimize this. Um, so uh, the optimization results in time complexity between O1 and ON, depending on the location of the iterators, the specified distance and the state of the colony memory blocks, so where our erasures are, essentially. Um, statistically ends up around about O log N, but it, it completely depends. Um, so how we do this is, let's start with the example of the distance function. So we've got two iterators, we're trying to find out how many non-erased elements are in between them. Let's say that those two Iterators are pointing to elements that are in two different memory blocks here, and in between we've got two memory blocks. So for the first memory block, um, we can either use plus plus iteration to find the distance between that element and the end of the memory block. So how many non-erased elements are between that element and the end of the memory block? Um, but if there are no erasures in that block, so basically if capacity is equal to size in terms of our block metadata, then we can just do pointer arithmetic or index arithmetic, depending on our iterator structure. We can just go, okay, what's the raw distance between me and the back of that memory block? Okay, we add that to our distance. Now, the, so that's basically either an ON operation or an O1 operation. Now the middle memory blocks, the memory blocks in between these two blocks, we can just skip over those. All we have to grab is the size data, so the number of uh, non-erased elements for each of those memory blocks. So we just go grab that, grab that, grab that, or however memory, uh, for however many memory blocks there are in between, and then we get to the back block. Um, now, sorry, the last block. So the block that contains the second iterator. So for that block, we have the same situation as the first block. So basically we check, does capacity equal to size? If not, then it has some erased elements. So we have to just iterate from the start of that block until we reach that iterator. If it doesn't have erased elements, then we can just do pointer arithmetic or index arithmetic. So. That's the basics. Um, if those two iterators are in the same block, uh, then the same thing applies. So are there any erasures in that block? No, we do point arithmetic. Yes, then we manually iterate. So slightly different for range arrays, I mean, but it's the same principle. Uh, for range arrays, we're, we're not worried about size, we're not worried about counting things. We're just going to get rid of those middle blocks in between our two iterators. Um, so we just keep that. We keep the uh, 
the block that the first iterator is in and the block that the last iterator is in and all the ones in between, we just deallocate them. Um, and if it's a trivially destructible type, we don't even have to iterate over those blocks and manually destruct those elements. We can just deallocate. Um, a few additional things for range arrays. Um, for those first and last memory blocks in our range array sequence, so if we go back there, those two blocks that we're keeping, um, we have to check, okay, do either of those blocks contain erasures? If they do, then we're going to have to find out where or whether there are any erasures within our range arrays range. So in the last memory block there, uh, you can see that there's a, a skip block within the range. So how do we find that skip block? Um, the probable best way is just to iterate over that range and just go, duh, duh, duh. okay, is there a skip block? Yes, I found a skip block there. Okay, we remove that uh, from the free list and we get rid of the skip block and we just create a larger skip block that covers that area. Um, alternatively, you could iterate over the free list instead, but free lists jump all over the place in memory, so it's nonlinear memory traversal could be slow for blocks with large numbers of skip blocks. Um, so as I said, so let's consider this a single memory block and we're range erasing a particular area. There's three pre-existing skip blocks. We check, does size equal to capacity? No, that means there's some erasures, that means there's some skip blocks. So we iterate over the range within the skip field. We find those skip blocks, we go up, uh, to the memory blocks, we find our free list nodes, our doubly, doubly linked index-based free lists. Um, we remove each of those blocks from the free list, and then we create a new skip block and we add that to the free list. Clear as mud. Um, so moving on to range slash fill slash initialize the list, insert or assign operations. Um, so we can optimize these as well. So if the colony is empty, that's pretty straightforward. You just do a reserve and then you do a block fill. Um, if it's not empty, then we want to re reuse as many skip blocks as we can. So we just, where possible, we just reuse skip blocks in their entirety, remove them from the free list, zero wipe their entries in the skip field. Um, and once we find a skip block that is larger than the remainder of the elements to be inserted, then we truncate that skip block instead of removing it. Um, and if there's a remainder after all the skip blocks have been used up, only at that point um, do we actually add to the back of the colony rather than just reusing stuff. Man, I am getting through this super fast compared to dry run. That's fine, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, okay, so going into splicing. Um, if you're familiar with standard list, you know that you can splice either a range of elements or an entire container from one standard list to another. This is kind of great in that it preserves all of your uh, iterative and pointers and references so you don't lose any validity. Um, but in the terms of colony, in terms of a container which is not allocating each element individually in memory all over the place, um, range splicing would mean splitting up memory blocks. So it's not really possible and you can only splice full colony containers from one into the other. Um, but this can still be useful. For example, in the uh, example I was talking about with games, if you've got a quad tree or an oct tree, um, then typically it'll be implemented as a series of different buckets. If those different buckets are implemented as colonies, um, when it comes time to combine those buckets, you can just splice one into another one and then you don't you uh, lose um, the validity of your iterators. Um, the location of where those spliced blocks go in terms of your sequence of blocks is implementation defined. 
The reason for that is that, for example, you could have a source colony and a destination colony. So you want to take the blocks from here, put them into here. Now, at the back of the destination colony, it could be reasonably full. Maybe you've only got a few elements before the end of the last block uh, that haven't been used. Whereas in the source, for example, you could have a very large number of elements that haven't been used at the back. So if you end up putting the source blocks in front of the destination blocks, that means at the back of for the back block of the source blocks, you've got that large range of um, space that hasn't been used up. That has to be turned into a skip block. Um, it has to be skipped over in the sequence, whereas if it's at the end of the entire sequence of blocks, then it just becomes the distance between the end iterator and the back of the block. So ideally, you want that space to be as small as possible uh, for cache locality. So in that case, you would want to take the source blocks and put them behind the destination blocks. That means that you only create a small skip block uh, for the back block of the destination blocks. Um, now, sorting. Um, as I said, colony is essentially an unordered container because the insertion is unordered, even though you once you've inserted something, the sequence is stable until you insert again. Um, but you can sort it if it's useful for your particular situation. Um, so much like standard list, it has its own internal sort function. Um, in terms of implementations, in terms of what I'm writing in the standard and this sort of thing, um, the sort technique is implementation defined. What I use is what I call indie sort which is an outgrowth of what I did with PLF list, which is another container. PLF list is essentially a more cache-friendly linked list. Um, I've subsequently found that this technique is also implemented in various different ways by other people. Um, so it's similar to a GitHub user, Morwin. I'm sorry, Morwin, I forget your full name. Um, but he's done one called Mountain Sort, which allows the use of um, random access sort techniques, so standard sort, etc., with non-random access containers, so bidirectional, this sort of thing. Um, and what you essentially do is you create an array of pointers to all of the elements in your container, and then you sort those pointers by the value of the elements that they point to, which is pretty easy to do. Um, and then subsequent to that, you've got this sorted array of pointers. Then you reorder the actual elements based on the sequence of those pointers. Um, so it allocates a little bit of extra memory, so um, essentially n number of pointers. Um, but it's very, very fast compared to, say, what standard list does. Um, and if you want more details on that, go to that link because it's also implementation, uh, implemented as its own uh, separate library if people want to use it. Okay. Yep, so somehow we've gotten to the end of this talk in probably two-thirds of the time that I anticipated, which is rather bizarre. I did actually have a bunch of additional slides um, for a particular thing which related to a trick I was using for performance. Um, the thing is that turned out, I basically looked at that and went, okay, this, is, this used to be true. This was true with GCC5. This used to perform better then. But when I started doing the slides, and I started researching it, and I started running all the code through Godbolt um, and comparing things. So I was like, okay, yeah, this is this is still better, but I'm not sure. So I won't just look at the actual assembly. I'm actually going to benchmark it. And when I did the benchmarking, what I found was that for modern compilers, that thing didn't work. So one of the side benefits of 
doing this talk is that it's increased the performance of the code. Um, to go into what that was very briefly, it was basically for a four-way decision pattern. So you've got um, condition A, condition B, and the sequences if A and B, or if not A and B, if not if A and not B, if not B and not A, do these four different things. And you can alternatively do that as a switch instead. You can go, okay, shift A up by one and uh, do a logical OR with that and B, and then base your switch decisions based on that. That used to be a lot faster for earlier versions of compilers back when I was working in, let's say, 2017, 2018. But the compilers have gotten better since then, and now they optimize the if-then-else situations better. So that was about five slides and about five to ten minutes worth of time, which I had to chuck. Um, the only fun note to come out of that was that when I looked at the Godboat coal, uh, the Godboat Godbolt translations for um, MSVC, somehow for debug, for the if then else variant, it was creating 10 branching conditions when the statements themselves only had six branching conditions, which was bizarre. Um, but that's it, that's the end of my talk. So if anybody has any questions at this point, please jump into the Q&A. Um, if there's anything that I haven't explained adequately that you'd like explained properly, um, jump in. Um, otherwise, we'll probably close it up. I'll just give it a minute. Uh, TLB, explain what that is. Not familiar with the acronym. Translation look aside buffer. No, I'm not familiar with what that is. Um, can you say what the side effects could be and what they would relate to in terms of virtual memory to physical memory address translation, similar to cache effects? Um, no, I can't say that I've looked into that. I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry, the Q&A is just disappearing. Um, I should really move the Q&A onto another window. There we go. Um, not quite sure how that would affect things. So unless you've got a very large container and it's somehow having to use virtual memory because of your actual memory being used up, um, not quite sure how that would affect things but this isn't my area of expertise. So if you have the time to write down how you think that could be problematic, I'm happy to hazard a guess. Okay, so how would Colony potentially be problematic there as opposed to something like a deck or a vector. For those who can't see the chat window, I'm not sure if that's recorded as part of the talk. Um, basically, Domagov, Igoz, Domagoz, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, is asking uh, whether I've considered how TL, uh, FTLB um, so whether this type of container and the techniques therein, um, how that would impact on the translation, translation look aside buffer. And the, the answer to that is, I don't know. Um, and he's just noting that some CPUs actually have smaller TLB buffers than L2 caches. And again, I'm just not as familiar with that territory. So I'm um, sorry, I can't answer that. Okay, uh, any other questions before we go? Give it half a minute.
Okay, Philip says, suppose you used a bit vector per memory block to mark skipped locations. There are instructions to count runs of one bits. You could use those two skip blocks of 8 slash 16 slash 32 slash 64 locations. Yep, so that's kind of similar to what I was talking about in terms of having a bit array and then referring up to the erased element memory space to grab your jump counting data, although in this case, what you're talking about is um, uh, probably interpreting a subsequent number of bits. Um, again, the problem of that is that it becomes conditional, so it's a branching operation once you encounter the one bit then you have to make some decision based on subsequent bits um, as to whether you're just skipping one bit or skipping more of the, than that. Um, the scenario that you're talking about doesn't, I wouldn't think would work out well for Colony because you know your skip blocks aren't always going to be powers of two. So um, yeah, I'm not sure how that would work. Very interesting. Simon Rayner says, very interesting talk. Did you run your benchmark on different processor architectures? Did the results differ significantly? Uh, just before I answer that, Simon, um, do you mean my benchmarks for Colony, the container, or do you mean my benchmarks just for the thing I was talking about before with the, the switch statement stuff? For colony in general, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, I've run it on a lot of different processes. Um, if you watch the 2016 talk, that was mostly or all, I think, core two benchmarks. Um, nowadays, I'm mostly running on Haswell or um, or earlier generation Intel CPUs. I have run on AMDs as well. I do occasionally still run them on core twos just for giggles. Um, the thing about core twos is that they have really bad branch prediction uh, compared to the i3s, i5s in general, etc. Um, so what you would find with comparing, for example, a colony to a, a bucket array or a colony using a bit field or a Boolean field instead of the jump counting skip field pattern, is that for the core twos, you know, when you got, uh, when you had no erasures, it was fine. When you had 25% of erasures, at that point, the low comp uh, the jump counting skip field is faster. When you get to 50% erasures, the Boolean skip field is really bad on the core twos because basically at that point, the branch prediction cannot do any effective prediction. It's, it's essentially, it's getting a random pattern so the performance goes terrible. And then once you get to 75% uh, random erasures, on the core two, the Boolean skip field gets better than when there was 50% erasures because now the branch prediction is able to accurately predict stuff some of the time. Um, so there are subtle differences, but a jump counting skip field is pretty much always faster than a Boolean skip field unless uh, you've got no erasures. Um, yeah, I haven't benchmarked on the most recent AMD or Intel CPUs. That's just because I don't have access to them. But from what I've seen, I don't think things change too much. Um, basically, because most of the what constitutes the performance comes from having multiple memory blocks, that's one thing. Uh, having a skip field and jumping over things rather than reallocating, not reallocating upon insertion, um, and reusing those memory spaces. So it doesn't seem to change that much, but if you go to the Colony website, I still, I believe, have the benchmarks listed for, just for earlier versions of Colony for MSVC, and for uh, the core two results. And they're all reasonably similar. So there's some minor performance differences when you go from uh, GCC or Clang to MSVC, but not so much for when you go from 
uh, GCC to Clang or vice versa. GCC and Clang tend to produce pretty similar code. Um, I've got another question coming through, but I just want to note one thing. When I went up from GCC 8 to GCC 9, 9 and 10, um, there was a huge performance drop uh, for Colony, and I had to look into it to work out why it was. It's basically some sort of GCC optimization bug, and after doing a bunch of changes which reduced some of the code size, it became better. GCC stopped optimizing it poorly. So things do change, but not that much. Okay, moving on. Stanislaw says, I have no idea how to code this cleanly in C++ as, a so as opposed to assembly, but for the polymorphism case, I'm guessing that you're referring to game entities and that sort of thing. Have you considered skip runs as a type of entity? that would merge the conditional into the dispatch, I think. I'm sorry, I'm not following you there. Um, have you considered skip runs as a type of entity? Okay, I think I'm getting what you mean. So essentially what you're saying is for a whole bunch of entities in a game engine or whatever, what you would be doing is okay, you got this entity, this entity, this entity, they're all active. You come to the next entity and that one is an entity that describes the number of runs, uh, sorry, the number of raised elements before you get to the next entity. So, yeah, I mean, you could do that but I don't think you'd get any additional performance out of it. Also, you've got to work in dealing with the polymorphic side of it. Um, I guess the advantage from your perspective would be that instead of having a skip field and having that additional memory space wasted, um, you just have that element have all of the jump counting and the skipping data within it. Yeah, okay, I think I'm with you now. Yeah, I hadn't considered that before, that's a good idea. Um, it is, however, a very specific scenario. So that would work, for example, for a game engine, I think. Um, so what he's talking about is rather than having a skip field, you basically have a slightly different type in your polymorphic case, and when you're iterating and you encounter that type, then you know, okay, now I'm going to be skipping a certain number of elements before I get to the next non-erased element that I actually want to process. But for example, if you come out of that and you're in, I'd say probably most other situations and you just got a bunch of stuff and you want to process it, um, say you've got integers or you've got relatively small struct or something like that, um, and you're just wanting to process all of them and you've got some of them that are erased, um, it becomes, and it's not a polymorphic type, then obviously at that point, you can't do this sort of thing. Um, the other thing is at that point, also you're doing branching and when you're doing a jump counting skip field, you don't have to worry about branching. So you could do that. Um, it'd be down to benchmarking as to whether or not that would be faster. My guess is that it wouldn't because you're introducing the branching, but I do not know. Um, yep, hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't entirely answer it, then um, yeah, just bring up another thing. We've got five minutes left, so cool. That question's done. Um, we've still got five minutes left, so if anybody else wants to answer, ask a question, go for it. Um, otherwise, I'll end the talk. Okay, I think that is us. Doesn't look like anybody else has got any questions. Um, and we're down from, I think, initially 24 participants to 17 participants, so sweet. <laughs> Only bored some people to death. That's excellent. Okay, so 
We end with a poem. The history of software is incomplete. There's so many people you will never meet who have benefited your lives in so many ways, but whom you couldn't name any given day. I'd name them myself, but we're all out of ours. So I bid you farewell. Goodbye, cowards. Thank you. <laughs>